I just want to know how hard you have worked to put this all together. I'm so thrilled that it's here. Finally, we have the day. So thank you for joining us for the nuts and bolts with content creators. Now we're going to begin with showing just a few clips from the web series and the podcast from our very talented panel. And so take it away and roll film. Thanks. Age. Some are blessed. Some are cursed. Some fight it. Some accept it. No one escapes. It comes for us all. Can we endure the slaughter with laughter, tears, friends, and a daily dose of coffee? That's just unsettling. Carbon dating. Aging is in. Do you know what it means for an African man to have his firstborn son who is gay? Where are you going? Douglas wants to leave later. We are here to celebrate the loss of our mother. If I may ask, who will be giving the eulogy? Jeremiah will be giving the eulogy. You can't even speak properly. Addy, shut up! Everybody shut up! I am aware that this is not a perfect thing. But what I wasn't aware of is that at a time like this, you couldn't put your petty differences aside and come together as a family. Have I paid for this already? Your son came by yesterday and took care of all the expenses. Damn. I had the money. I didn't ask you to pay me back. I need your type of money. What'd you say to him? Well, you better watch it. Dad, Douglas is very important to this family. He has to be here for mom's funeral. I can't stop you from having a relationship with your siblings. But you, you don't have to call me father anymore. TV off and come in here. Lunch is ready. The Bears are playing. Record it. I don't want to record it. I want to watch it and not when the whole world already knows the score. What is that? It's a salad. So good for you. Mm. Lots of superfoods. Kale, quinoa. It's all raw. Nothing cooked. Becca doesn't cook. Mm -hmm. I know. Also, we have gluten-free croutons and the dressing's made of green tea and chia seeds. Chia seeds. Is that like chia pets? <gasps> exactly. The seeds are what they make the pets from, and it's really nutritious. Who knew, right? <laughs> oh, indeed. Oh, I should have eaten the hair off the Donald Trump doll I got for Christmas before <laughs> I threw it away. <laughs> Is there any real food I can eat? I'm sorry, he's not used to this. Up, I'll, I'll get you a sandwich, Al. Mom? You can't coddle him. Dad? Becca made... This salad, especially for you. It's specifically formulated, you know, to help with your arthritis, mm -hmm. and your blood pressure, your high cholesterol, your low blood sugar, and your acid reflux. How thoughtful was that? I don't know. How thoughtful is it? Root sandwich, please. Josh, maybe we should just tell him why we're really here. Oh, you mean it's not this delightful repast we enjoy? That's part of it. Well, Pop, um, as you know, Becca is studying to be a geriatric nutritionist. Oh, that's funny. She doesn't look geriatric. <laughs> I'm not geriatric. You're geriatric. Geriatric means elderly. Oh, does it? Mm -hmm. That she's trying to help you. We both are just trying to help you. Really? Really. Right, we're just trying to be here for you. You know. Help you manage things. Drive you places. Mm -hmm. Drive me places. Well, I mean, even move in if you need. What? Why? To help you out because you're elderly. Elderly? No, 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 no. I am not elderly. Pop, you're 70. 70 is not elderly. I am not elderly. Well, then what are you? Christ, I don't know. Uh, uh, late middle aged. If we live to 140, then maybe you'd be late middle-aged. All right, then. I'm a senior, a retiree. I'm old, okay, but I am not elderly. Old? Elderly? I mean, what's the difference? The difference is the elderly 
are those little four-foot people hunched over their walkers who slip in bathtubs and yell, help, I've fallen and I can't get up, who, who, who can't eat food that has to be chewed, who, who gets scammed by Nigerians sitting in internet cafes and publishers clearing house. I am not elderly. I can still do things. Then why don't you? Why don't I what? Do things? Because there's nothing I want to do. And then what's the point of being retired if you have to keep doing things? Better just... And I don't need any help. Hi, it's Phil Henry. All the voices you hear on the show today, everybody that I interview, everyone that I take a phone call from, all the people that I talk to in studio, they're all me. This is the world-famous Phil Henry Show. And this, then, is O Sleeper with Death from Above. Ooh. You know, have a little respect, General. This is an artistic effort. Real artistic. Uh, anyway, this is General Galen Shaw. Woo! Oh, grow up. Come on, Margaret. And, uh, I'm Bud Dickman. Oh, yes, I was going to say that. I'm Robert Leonard. I wasn't going to say that. And now here's Phil Henry. Thank you. All right, let's just uh, explore that for a moment. You know, right away you want to get into it. No, wait, I just want to turn it up, Bud. Oh, you're right, it is garbage. I told you it's garbage. Why, is it, why are you saying it's garbage now, Margaret? Well, it isn't garbage in the strictest sense. In other words, uh, officially, I think it's wonderful music. But yes, to me personally, um, just sitting here, having to endure another Monday, yes, it's garbage. It, it uh, definitely is going to cause me some... You don't have to keep staring at me, General. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for... See, this is the whole thing about staring at... You know, she, she doesn't like that. You're always talking about him staring at you. You know, he, he, what's, you're talking, so... Uh, yeah, try and spit it out, Phil. Try and do it without going into this arm-flapping, epileptic fit that you go into. <laughs> Shut up, will you? <laughs> and those are all, Phil, Henry. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us. Again, that, uh, we're, I'd like to introduce everyone one by one. Um, Nancy Hendrickson is the writer-producer-director of Boomers. Nancy started uh, as an actress with a BFA in drama from Carnegie Mellon University, which is where we first met. Um, after writing promo spots for the Disney Channel, she segued into writing screenplays and became a member of the WGA. Her screenplays have placed in the Austin Film Festival, the Nichols Fellowship, Sundance Institute Writers Workshop, and the Eugene O'Neill National Playwrights Conference. She's written and directed three short films and currently teaches screenwriting at California State University, Northridge. The first season of Boomers, which she wrote, produced, and directed with her creative partner, Sarah Caldwell, is available on YouTube. And uh, I guess I don't need to make a full disclosure statement because you probably, you might have recognized me in her <laughs> project, Boomers. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Lester Latham is a producer actor in Blended Family. Lester has been involved in all aspects. <laughs> Lester has been involved in all aspects of theater and movie performance for more than 40 years. After a tour of duty in Vietnam, he obtained a Bachelor of Science in Theater and Aerospace. He rejoined. <laughs> interesting combination. He re rejoined the military and produced plays and movies while on active duty. Very busy. Uh, his credits include, uh, he earned his SAG membership by starring in Air Force One with Harrison Ford. His credits include Gone Girl, Court of Conscience with John Voight, and Lifetime TV's The Night Stalker. He played civil rights leader Roy Wilkins in All the Way at Theater Squared, and recently he starred in independent features, music videos, and short films, one of which, a short film called Lucifer, he starred in, which uh, was, um, was selected for the Cannes Film Festival. Lester Latham. <laughs> Amanda Sarah is an actor, writer, producer, director of Carbon Dating. <laughs> Amanda has written for print publications and is the playwright of numerous plays that have been staged in Pittsburgh, New York, and Los Angeles. Her film credits include Butter, The Newness, and Threshold. In television, she starred in Seal Team, The Outsiders, Criminal Minds, and she continues to do Theater Girl after my own heart. 
Amanda wrote, produced, directed, and starred in the web series, Carbon Dating, along with Michael Gross. <laughs> Amanda, Sarah. <laughs> Michael Gross, actor, producer, Carbon Dating, and of course, Family Tides. During his 45-year career, Michael Gross is perhaps best known as Stephen Keaton on the TV series Family Ties. Michael's had an extensive career in film, television, and theater. On the big screen, he starred in all six of the cult sci-fi movies Tremors, with the seventh one upcoming. Other film credits include Sidney Lumet's Just Tell Me What You Want, Big Business with Lily Tomlin, Alan and Naomi, and Stay Cool. And in 2019, he'll be seen in a Disney film, Noel. On television, he's returning to Netflix's Grace and Frankie this spring. <laughs> he's produced and recurred in the web series Carbon Dating, Michael Gross. <laughs> Phil Hendry, creator of The Phil Hendry Show. Former radio broadcaster turned pod podcaster, Phil Hendry is also an in-demand voiceover and character actor. He's provided over 20 voices on King of the Hill. Other credits include This is 40, Team America World Police, Semi Pro, and Futurama Into the Wild Green. Phil has been a regular on Teachers and has had guest star roles on Modern Family, Giants of Radio, and is a recurring actor on The Unit, Futurama, The Replacements, <laughs> and the animated Napoleon Dynamite. His uh, recent credits include The Connors, New Girl, and Drunk History. Phil hosts his critically acclaimed podcast radio show, The Phil Hendry Show, out of Los Angeles. Phil Hendry. <laughs> and we have Dan Bowser, National Director, Entertainment Contract, SAG-AFTRA. Dan joined C Screen Actors Guild SAG after in 2007 as a business representative in the television contracts department and has written, risen to his current position of National Director of Entertainment Contracts at sag -AFTRA. He oversees the administration and enforcement of television, new media, and theatrical contracts, as well as works with the executive directors of the department to set the strategic direction of the department. Dan Bowser. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. And I'd like to begin with a general question to whoever wants to pop up their hand first. And then we'll continue with everybody. Where were you in your career when you decided it was time to take your own initiative and create a series, or in Phil's case, a podcast? Yes, Phil, go for it. Use, use, your, use your, uh, your mic because we're... But Just kidding. I, I, <coughs> you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I forgot. I forgot. I had the microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I was at a place where radio could no longer sustain what I did. I did a um, uh, a multi voice radio show. I did a character intensive show. It was not really. I did a talk show, but it was it was a satire of a talk show, and uh, it was quite uh, stylized. And I found that uh, advertising support and affiliate support was not what I'd like it to be. So when my contract ended, I, I realized there was this world called digital out there, and I was fortunate enough to be getting some uh, on-camera work as well as voiceover work, so I decided to go ahead and start my own company and start a digital platform for it. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing because it turned out to be a ton of work, and I'm now six, seven years, well, 2006, I'm 12 years into it, and it's marketing. It's, you know, it's like owning a restaurant. You're flushing the toilets, you're cleaning out the thing, you're cooking the food, you're, you know, hopefully not going directly from the bathroom to the kitchen, but you're, uh, you're doing it all. And, and it is. It's a lot of work. You, there's also a thing called copyright protection, which you guys, that's a whole other thing I could tell you about. When your stuff is out online and people are uploading it for public file sharing illegally, you have to have legal. You have to have an attorney. And I learned that, you know, which I run about a $20,000 a year legal tab. So... I don't want to start with the bad news, but you know, I, I, radio at least, they paid for the lawyers over there. So I had to do all of that myself. But yeah, it was at the end of, and really radio today is, a, is more or less a political talk, sh talk medium. And I do entertainment talk and it just made sense. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Next. Nancy? Oh, Amanda, go oh. for it. Um, I was in a 
uh, class about the business of acting at the Actors Workout Studio in North Hollywood and our instructor Fran Montano said there's no excuse in this day and age of digital media that we as actors cannot create our own content um, because we're always looking for uh, r footage for reels and, and ways of promoting ourselves and my uh, good friend Marcy Barkin, who you saw in Carbon Dating, said to me, she said, I would love to be in a web series, but I don't know how to write. And I turned to her and I said, well, I write. And she said, well, write us something. So <laughs> in six weeks, I handed her the first season of Carbon Dating. And she, uh, the encouragement I got was that she laughed all the way through it. And then it was a matter of uh, creating it. And I don't know if we want to get into that right now, or, or we'll okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, May I? Okay. Oh. Nancy, you want to say something? Go ahead. Um, Ellen and I met in a conservatory acting program at CMU. So we were all being trained to do nothing but act. We had no other skills coming out of there. Literally. But we had one professor, and I remember it to this day. He said, have something you can do on your own. He was mime, but he said, have something you can do without waiting for somebody to hire you to do it. And I always remembered that. And at one point in my acting career, I said, I got to start writing parts for myself <laughs> because, you know, I'm not getting the parts I want. Um, well, then I started writing and I would get um, attachments and deals on the table and then they would fall off the table and when digital filmmaking came in I thought I have to learn how to make films so I can see some of my stories on the screen. So in the like early 2000s I made a few short films and um, it was kind of a natural outgrowth of that you know that and a combination of getting tired of not seeing my as I got older, not seeing myself reflected on the in the movies and TV. I'm going to j jump in and say something and just yeah. uh, something that Nancy said. I mean, this is this is in some ways the equivalent of what the acting teachers used to tell you once upon a time. If you don't have something to do, create a one-person show, uh -huh. create something you can do, and you don't have to have somebody else hire you. And a lot of good acting teachers have said that. Develop something, develop a character, develop a one-person show. Um, and uh, and so this is, I think, the digital equivalent of that in some ways. And I'll be very brief in saying I think I um, I think I started learning about this because um, I started hanging around with younger people. That gets easier and easier for me as I grow older. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and uh, I saw they were all doing this this thing. And I'm very late to social media. It's probably been maybe six years or something like that. And I know a lot of the basics. I've never made a a film except in conjunction with uh, Amanda here. I'm not interested in that. I'm primarily in act. I, my interest may be primarily acting, directing. Um, but um, I decided I better get serious about it as a marketing ploy, Simpl simply speaking, self-serving. Uh, not making my own stuff, but just starting to post. And we can talk a little bit about that. What I do is pretty basic. Um, it was when I was uh, getting into a film with somebody, and I said, I don't and I talked to one of the uh, the execs on on a piece, and I said, "I gee, that's f what an odd choice for this this other actor. I, where where does that come from?" They said, "He has 186,000 followers on Facebook." I went, "Oh, okay, <laughs> built-in audience. You know, he has a following." It's like, "Oh dear, do I have to get a following?" <laughs> Aside from my grandchildren, you know, so. Um, uh, so uh, it was a uh, kind of uh, publisher parish in a way, you know, it's like, all right, do, do this thing. And uh, I have lots of warnings about it too. Be careful what you wish for uh, in getting into social media. Uh, I think it was uh, in Man and Superman, uh, Shaw said there are uh, only two great tragedies and there are two tragedies in life. One is g never getting the object of your desire. The other is getting it. Um, and uh, so you have to be be careful what you wish for because it becomes a job, as as he was just as he was just saying. Um, you wind up doing a little bit of everything. But that's my beginning story. Great, thank you, Lester. Yeah, my mine came when I was 
on my way to Hong Kong one day. And before I became an actor, I was a 747 captain for United Airlines. And so for the, please talk into the mic. <laughs> Pearls of wisdom, thank you. So I was a 747 captain for United Airlines. And while on my way to, to Hong Kong one day, I, I realized that I had nothing but that one movie, Air Force One. And so I'm sitting there thinking, how can I create something for myself? So I created, uh, I didn't create them, I started doing two shows. I started doing Paul Robeson, and then I did uh, Thurgood Marshall. And both are one-man shows, so they were very easy to do and to cart around to different places. Afterwards, I decided that once I retired from United, I was going to come to LA and sink my feet into this, this business full time and do what I knew I needed to do. And it, was, it took me almost five years to realize that I could create my own content. And because I was busy doing a lot of things, but never anything of my own. And that's how Blended Family came about. Great. Thank you all. Um, now, are you finding that there is a need to see content about and from people over 60, uh, 55, rather? Have you, have, you, have you noticed that? And also, to add to that, follow up on that, have you made a conscious choice to perhaps appeal to a cross-generational audience? So first, do you think there's a great need for over 55 content, and then how do you make that into a broader audience, or do you? Well, I didn't think of in terms of how old the audience would be. I thought in terms of, did I have an audience for the project? Was there someone out there that was interested in watching a man who had five wives and 15 children? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, um, and then, and then uh, Phil, I know you. I, I found that um, our, our series is on YouTube and I found that it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, there are fewer of our generation and up that are on YouTube, so they're not finding it. Um, and they're often not on social media, so they don't know to look there to find it. Um, on the other hand, because there are not a lot of uh, shows on social media ab about our generations, that it's an open field a little bit. And um, so what we found, what I found was our crew was mostly made up of younger, uh, younger crew people, and we had some younger actors as well. But um, when they read the script, they. The, I remember my DP said, she said, I laugh so hard because I see my mom doing this. And I thought, oh good, we can reach both demographics. <laughs> Phil, you started to well, jump I, in there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I believe that it's, for me, and I know it's different for, for everybody, I think it's, I, probably it's much different for women because they do see a paucity of roles and, and things to do. But for me, it's just, uh, what do I think is funny? and go ahead and say it. Um, and if younger people get it, I think I have an audience that spans primarily male 35 to 54, 30, 35 to 64. So, and I do have extremely young listeners as well, which is a whole other thing. But um, I think you have to just be authentic to what's funny and do it. Um, that's for me. And so I, I can't think in terms of age. If I do, then you start trying to be hip or something. You know, you start going, well, I better find out. What is, for instance, a Fry Festival? And uh, anybody? Okay, so yeah, I, 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 was, I was at UCB the other night. I was a judge for the Nerd Olympics at UCB the other night. Me and four other judges who are like 20 years younger than me, and all the performers were in their 20s, and they're out there talking about YouTube personalities. I had no clue. So I just broke into doing voices. And they found it funny. You know, I started, I started to do Bobby Dooley, and they said, who's that? I said, it's my mother. And they, so there's a commonality there. Great. Nancy. Um, I, I was very much concerned with content for our age group. Um, one reason is because I was talking to friends who had stayed with acting. I'd say, segued into writing. And I found that these actors weren't getting the parts that they used to get. I mean, they were still working, but 
um, the parts were peripheral to the action. They weren't the leads. They weren't the main parts. Um, somebody said, um, you, uh, it might have been you, said you either get to play grandma if you're a woman or a judge if you're a male. <laughs> and, and that to me was sad because I thought all these people have so much to offer and no outlet. And for me, I noticed that I was, if I, if I watch the TV, the news, elections, anything like that, I felt like no one was talking to me anymore. They were talking to 40 and 50 year olds and saying, your mother could be the victim of an elder scam. <laughs> you know, and I realized, oh my God, I'm the mother. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody's talking directly to me and there aren't characters I can identify with. And the things that my friends and I discuss on Facebook the memes we pass around are are not part of the conversation on on TV or in movies anymore. So I thought this is a great opportunity. And uh, aside from carbon dating, I didn't know any other web series that were doing this. I thought everybody's retired. They're on Facebook. They need some content. And then we found the other side to the double-edged sword, which is people saying, oh, so you you made a a play <laughs> you're doing you're doing um a panel what is it you were doing <laughs> nobody had heard of web series and um and they weren't good at going to youtube to find things so uh we are trying to broaden the audience just so that um you know we can keep the show alive but it's it i want it to be mainly geared toward baby boomer generation and i would like to see other shows like that thank you now i i know um i know michael and i were talking about this a little before we began and that is what would you say to audience members here or in the great beyond hello uh those of you who are listening in uh, who want to create projects but are intimidated with production and technology and in particularly uh, the social media of today. So, uh, Michael, since you were talking about this, do you want to begin? Well, I'm a little curious, just in our audience, for example, how many are on social media? Oh, okay, so I would say two-thirds or something like that. So you have some, do you have face, primarily Facebook at our age? Yeah. All right. Instagram, see yeah, and um, I, I'm just maybe get, not Snapchat, but you know, maybe. just talking a little bit about this, I decided to do a survey of my uh, you know high school high school grandchildren, and I said, where do people where do people go? And uh, I talked about s Snapchat, and my granddaughter said, oh, that's middle schoolers, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it may not be for everybody, but that's my granddaughter's point of view, and um, and uh, she said it was primarily Instagram and Twitter primarily Instagram, Twitter. She said, I've, I've never done Facebook, I don't belong to Facebook, all that sort of thing. Doesn't mean you can't use those things. Uh, if, if you know a little bit about this, you know that you can use Instagram and have it link to your face, to both Facebook and Twitter uh, easily, so you can post something on Instagram. So that's, 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 the, that's the big thing amongst younger people. But you can also reach the older people through uh, Facebook, which is you know one of the early social media Thing. So you can reach them through uh, through that. I think, um, uh, and again, I, I began doing this as a way of simply um, gaining an audience, uh, gaining following. If any of you, you may have Facebook timelines, which is you may know are different than Facebook pages. A page is more like an advertising thing for a group, an organization, uh, uh, a celebrity, uh, an actor, an artist, all that sort of thing, a page where instead of gaining friends, you gain likes, uh, and people follow your page. And that's what I primarily use for, for advertisement. It's a simple way to, but that's a good place to begin. So I would be become comfortable with, uh, with social me that sort of social media, become comfortable with posting photographs or short videos of yourself on Instagram, uh, other things like that. Uh, crawl and, and, and walk before you run. To get your get your feet wet and learn from learn from others and watch what other people are doing on those things, um, I know this is. Uh, I just brought some show and tell. This is very helpful. There are things like this. Facebook for dummies. Okay, I'm serious. 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And this particularly for pages, Facebook marketing. Okay? There are podcasts for dummies. There is, there is a book called, um, there is a book called, uh, I saw it the other day, Facebook and Twitter for seniors. Now, that's a good place to start, but you don't have to know everything about this stuff. You just need to know where to get us started before you start doing your own productions, quote unquote. You've got to know where to, where, where to start and how to become familiar enough with these platforms. So these are, these are places to start. Thank you so much. That's good. Can I ask Dan a question? Sure. Go our, for it. Our Bill. marketing, you know, this is the man who's negotiating the deals for us. Where, where are we at in terms of podcasting? Because I'm a producer, yeah. so you're not really, you wouldn't be negotiating on my behalf, unless it's with a platform, a larger platform. All right. Um, one thing about podcasts, that is a, a very new area that we are signing. We just started signing podcasts uh, in 2018. Uh, so they're slowly coming in, and we are developing uh, agreements for for podcast producers. Uh, we between do, who and who between oh, the producer oh, right now. Right now, most of the uh, podcast producers are just uh, you know just regular uh, members who are just wanting to put something on YouTube, a podcast on YouTube. Okay. Uh, we do not have. Uh, we're working on uh, really just reaching out to companies, uh, but right now, majority of our podcasts that we are signing, uh, they're with uh, individual producers. Okay, good. Yeah. So these are actors and producers who have an adversarial relationship with themselves, <laughs> right? <laughs> Essentially, you know. But they're but they're being signed to platforms, and, and what Dan was saying, I, my podcast is on Podcast One. And that's a platform because they sell advertising in my show. Now, you can put your podcast anywhere. You can put it on sound. There's a lot of platforms, SoundCloud. You can put it on Facebook. You can put it anywhere. What Dan's talking about is the podcasting platform that will represent you as an advertising uh, account exec. People that are making you the money, right. in other words. And Podcast One is one of them. That's who I'm with. So Sideshow Network is another. That's where they, you get together and you say to them, okay, what can you do for me? And they'll say, nothing. I'll say thank you, and then you go to the next guy. But um, no, they'll say, "How many downloads have you got?" I don't know, man. You know, like, go go and check and see. Uh, so that was a, that was a fascinating aspect of that that I haven't heard much about. Right, and, and again, just going back to the you know your question, uh, this is a very very early uh, stages. Uh, you know, we definitely are trying to meet uh, you know companies, uh, performers who have reached out to us that want to uh, sign the podcast, and they have a company that they want to uh, put us in connection with. We are. Uh, willing to talk to everybody, uh, we work out terms. Uh, you know, this is a very early, early stages, and you know, we want to make sure this is an easy process for both, uh, you know, the podcast producer as well as uh, you know the members who are working on this. So we want to have a very, uh, you know, good relationship, and uh, we're willing to just have a very uh, open dialogue and to really just ensure that performers are protected as well as uh, you know getting getting a deal in place. Th uh, thank you, and I actually was going to ask you about this later, um, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I, I know you say you're working mostly with, uh, with companies, but while we're here, let me ask, because I have friends who have asked about this, about the podcast uh, agreement. What, if you're an individual and you aren't yet with a company, uh, as Phil is, what should you, I think we all here are clearly devoted dedicated union members and want to do everything with the union and, and union projects. So, so Dan, what, what, do, what does an individual do if they say, hey, I want to do a podcast? Because I'm sure they don't want to be in violation, but they don't know what to do, so what do they do? Okay. Well, on our website, there is a uh, uh, new media page, it's a production center where one can uh, fill out a uh, project, it's called a project information sheet. You tell us more about your project. Uh, you send it back to the union. The union will review it, and then they will get back to you. It's a, it's a very easy process, uh, you know, because our goal is we're, not, we're just trying to ensure that performers are working under a union contract, uh, and the information that we require is just uh, the, you know, budget uh, because we want to ensure that it's under the proper agreements, sliding scale. This is no different from a performer a producer, member producer that is working on a new media series where we just want basic information in order for uh, us to really just uh, determine the correct agreement. 
Uh, it's a very easy process. Everything's online. Uh, we do have uh, business reps that are willing to uh, talk to you and, and walk everyone through the uh, process. In addition, we do uh, conduct monthly seminars to uh, go over uh, just go paperwork, how to really fill out the paperwork, how to really you know submit uh, production, timesheets, things of that nature. Uh, we we want to be very inclusive because our goal is to uh, get out of the way of the creative. We want the creatives to be creative, and this you know just understanding the business aspect. We understand a very a very tasking uh, you know a, a amount of uh, work to paperwork just submit it, and we want to make this as easy as possible. Uh, so we are very hands-on. We want to ensure that uh, this is uh, not a uh, deterrent for you to sign an agreement. We want to really just be more of a partner in order for you to, uh, you know, just go through the process, learn from the process, and, and just create. While we're here, uh, I'm just kind of jumping ahead, but jumping, I want to get all of these questions answered while we have them. When is the next one of those uh, seminars that people could go to, and where and how do they find out oh, about sure. it? Okay, uh, we have our new media seminar every month, the third Tuesday of each month. We just had one uh, January 15th. Our next meeting is uh, February 19th. Uh, it's going to be in Cagney. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. And usually there is a, there's a every month there's a posting uh, on the website so you can RSVP. Uh, you know, so you lay, they let you know the time and dates and uh, you know, just click a link and you submit your name and you are on the list. And there are two business reps that are at the meeting. They will go over the uh, whole signatory process, and they are there to answer questions until uh, every question is answered. Under and, and understand, these are not people who are telling you how to create new media. They're talking about the contract via yes. SAG, you know, the business right. side of things. Okay. Yes. Can I talk about creating? About what? Uh, about the equipment? Because people say, oh, I want to do let a podcast. Me, let me get to that in a minute. I actually have that question for you. But so I you've got all the questions. I, I don't do, need to say I anything. Do, I know. <laughs> yeah. No, no I, I'm, I'm going to ask you that question I in a minute. But I, I did ask this question, which led us to this kind of side road, which is what do you say to somebody who's intimidated about um, creating project, uh, I'm social media, but also uh, the technical side of it, the production side of it. Do you have some advice to people who are saying, I'd love to do this, but I'm a little intimidated by it? Um, Nancy. I do. I think uh, you don't have to be intimidated anymore. When I first started making uh, films, um, actually the first film I was involved with was done on 35 and um, cut on a big machine. Everything is digital now. But I wanted to say that the people making the most money off the internet and who have the biggest following are the influencers. And they're people that just very often, they're young people, uh, they do silly things and they get, they get an audience, gradually get more and more and more and more. And now, these days when a film comes out, the studios wanna pay those influencers because they have such huge followings to mention their film. So once you have the following, you can do anything. And there is a woman, believe it or not, who just eats pickles. <laughs> the pickle lady. She on, on YouTube, she eats a pickle in every one of her videos, and she has a huge following. So get I can't that. wait. Yes. <laughs> I just, yes. what have I been missing? <laughs> Getting, getting back to what Michael said and what my teacher was saying about having something you can do, not necessarily eating pickles, but, but if you have a character, you know, if you love, like, like Billy Bob Thornton developed Sling Blade out of a character, he, he did, he put a story around it, but if you have a character and you can write yourself some monologues or write even a little two-person scene, you can have somebody fill you with, film you with your, um, your iPhone, your smartphone, and upload it, maybe one of your kids, <laughs> and upload it to Facebook because a lot of webisodes are only one or two minutes long. I guarantee you, if you're clever or funny or interesting in some way, you start to get a big following, you won't have any trouble turning it into whatever you want to turn it into. This know. is an important thing I think uh, Nancy's saying because it brings me to another point. Uh, uh, 
you can get a huge following by doing the most ridiculous uh, sorts of things. Uh, and uh, you have to be careful. Do you, uh, there's an apocryphal story about uh, uh, Laurence Olivier once going to uh, Richard Burton when Richard Burton was becoming famous in film and saying, Richard, do you want to be a great actor or do you want to be a household name? And not that the two are mutually exclusive, but uh, he was saying, stick to your stick to your foundation, stick to what you want to do. And so you have to remember, do you want to become an internet phenomenon or do you want to be an actor? And do you want to be Paris Hilton or do you want to be an actor? So you have to, you know, uh, you know, one of the Kardashians or an actor, you know, you just have to. And so you c if you can leverage something into what you really want to do, but you have to be careful because it can, it can lead all these, it's like fame in itself feels pretty wonderful sometimes. And you, some of you may decide you want to stop there. That's fine, that's your choice, but keep an eye on what your ultimate goal is in, in, in terms of trying to attract a following. I just want to say that um, the tools are in the hands of everybody now. The tools of this art form are in the hands of everyone. It used to be that you could only make film if you had a rich guy paying you to make a film, and now everyone can make movies. Everybody can do everything, and I think that's great because even though everybody had canvas and paint, there was still only one Picasso, there's still only one Rembrandt, but everybody's got a shot. So you can try stuff, you can be experimental. You know, Michael's right, you know, you don't want to be known for something you don't want to be known for. Like maybe that woman that's eating pickles is like ready for suicide every night, which <laughs> looks at that, but. She's probably got enough of a following, though, because YouTube does attract advertisers, and you get paid. And, I, and, I, and, on, the pa and on, that, uh, on the stage with me the other night at UCB was this dude who does a YouTube page. He, he makes a living at this, him and his buddy just sitting there ripping on movies, and they get enough advertising bread to like, pay the rent. So, yeah, you never know um, what it is. Um, YouTube has changed um, its advertising rules. Um, it used to be that you could monetize your uh, content and um, as long as it was your original content, you could earn advertising dollars by attaching ads. What they've now changed it to is that you have to have at least 1,000 followers and at least 10,000 viewing minutes before you can attach. So uh, that's a little exclusive of a lot of our web series. Um, I, w I just wanted to say is that yes, you can go from an iPhone, uh, film your, your whatever you want, your content, and upload it, and it's it it can be that easy. Um, however, for me, I I had all these ideas. I had written them out, and um, I didn't know where to go from there because my experience has been with stage, not with a film or TV, uh, as far as being behind the camera. So I mentored with someone who was experienced in that, and and it. It was very helpful, and in fact, she introduced m me to Michael, who then came on board. But um, so you have that o opportunity as well. You know, we know so many people, and mentoring is something I think that a lot of people like to do, and um, so that can help you as well. If you're really just are uh, just too afraid to do it on your own, you can reach out to people in your circle, and and s through somebody, they're going to be able to help you. Lester, thank you. That's great. Thank you. I um, I believe that anyone in this room can create their own content. I, I have a studio in my apartment. Sound, lights, cameras, tripods. So in the comforts of your own home, you can create something as quiet or as loud as you want. At the same time, if you want to get bigger than that, that's where the money comes in, and that's where most people fall short. They don't have the finances to create that product and which they want to bring to the public. So that's where you need the audience. I think one should start with a web page, one that's just you. And everything is about you so that we get to know who we're looking at. And then once you've created an environment for you, then you can branch out and do other things. Now, along with that, you need other people to help you with that process. In my case, I had the money, so I decided to drop $50,000 and to do it all myself. So I bought equipment, cameras, and the whole works. That way, I cut out a lot of middle people. But at the same time, it's money that I put out 
So I need to know how I can get my money back. I need to know how I can reach that audience for my program. And I also need to know how can I get good quality talent in front of the camera and behind the camera. You get what you pay for. You can sit at home and do it and get it for free. But if you want quality sound people, a quality DP, it's going to cost you money. So when you've got an idea, think of it as a total package, not just as the printed page. When I work on this, how far out am I going to go in terms of bringing everyone that's necessary involved? How do you monetize? Um, you, you sell advertising for the series around it? See, you're, you're just, you've just made me transition into my next question. I'm sorry. I didn't no, that, I'm just putting stuff I think, out. I, I, that, no, but we're in some sort of mind meld, which is fabulous. <laughs> so um, uh, before we leave, though, I have to, uh, this, this area, I have to ask a quick question of Dan, because I think I have to clear this up. So, but we're asking if, for example, I know we have an agreement last year, I believe it was, that we had an agree our first agreement with influencers, with some of the top influencers. I know we've been reaching yeah. out in that way, so there is that agreement. But say if we are like putting something out on YouTube, should we be contacting sag after about, I, I think there's a lot of confusion of what's covered, what's non-covered, what do I, d can I start out with just me talking on YouTube or should that be under an agreement? I know, I know uh, my friends and I have been a little unclear about, about all of that. Could you clear that up before I move on to my next question, which is also Phil's next question? Okay. Or yeah, and, and you know what? This is a question that comes uh, up a lot during our new media uh, seminars. You know, what actually is covered? What can I do? Uh, you know, if I'm on the internet, you know, can I just, you know, I just talk about my life? Is that something that's covered? Uh, you know, for our purpose, uh, we always look at the um, aspect of, you know, are you performing? You know, if you're if you read lines of scripts, of course that's covered. But then there's a, you know, if you're uh, maybe a, a talk doing a talk show like uh, something on the internet, would that be covered? Yes. Uh, if you're just talking about your life, that's more like reality based. We don't really cover reality. I would just think about that. Uh, you know, is this something that I'm really performing? Is this something that really requires me just uh, preparing things of that nature? Uh, you know, and it's very broad because one thing about new media. It's, it's ever evolving, it's, cha it's changing. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, you know, we really didn't cover a lot of new media, but look at it now. We Last year we covered, signed over like 2,800 uh, new media productions, and it's increasing each year uh, because more and more people are uh, really just, you know, signing new media. It's, it's evolving, it's uh, really it's taking over, uh, you know, just mainstream TV. Most, most uh, younger generation think of streaming as like the main way to really view content. Uh, you know, but just to go back to your, your question, Ellen, uh, I would just, I mean, I would always just recommend call the union and we could get go over this on a case by case basis. Uh, but, you know, just the generals, uh, you know, just if you're really just talking about yourself, if it's like seemed like more of a reality base, uh, and this is something we probably wouldn't cover, but uh, script or, uh, you know, script lines or even your own script. You know, like a monologue? Something you wrote? And, and you know what? I would think of that more like, a, um, like an audition or something. Like, it, you know, that, again, if you're not really, you know, you're not really trying to, you know, monetize that. This is really just, I'm doing a, uh, you know, monologue or things of that nature. It's like a resume, putting it out to the, the casting, uh, you know, community out there. That, hey, this is what I'm doing right now. This is, my, this is my range, things of that nature. I still, I wouldn't think that would be something that we would cover. I, well, I do want to say, uh, you know, one, one thing about m uh, myself and my staff, I mean, we're, we're not trying to uh, police anyone. We we just want to give information out. So, you know, just feel free to, uh, you know, call, uh, you know, my department. Uh, you could look on the website. There's uh, plenty of, uh, you know, information on the website. But, you know, feel free to call. I mean, you know, we're not trying to, uh, you know, just track anyone down and say, hey, you're doing non-union work. This is really more about providing information, uh, you know, to members. And All kidding aside, there are a lot of resources there, yeah. you know, so it's always best to go yeah. with the rules. Come <laughs> yes. on. Yes. And, and speaking of resources now, what, what we're talking about is monetizing and it's sort of after the fact. That is the next question, in fact. Oh. <laughs> okay. So go for oh, it. Okay. So before the fact, um, and you need money for your uh, series or uh, whatever content you're creating, um, nowadays there's 
there's a lot of different crowdfunding uh, besides, you know, besides if you're if you're looking for um, uh, uh, investors, uh, th that sort of thing, you know, it's usually with a bigger project. But what we did was we went through a crowdfunding to cover the expenses that we didn't have on our on our own <laughs> to um, to make the series. the The drawback to that is is that usually you can only ask your friends and family once. So make sure it counts, you know, for your, your series. After that, you got to run on your own laurels. I just want to say one thing before you get to monetizing, if that's OK. Yeah, um, this is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it, these days, I'm active in the, in the Writers Guild, even though I was originally a member of SAG. Um, and I joined the Longevity Committee, which is people in our demographic. And the entire meeting consists of people complaining that they can't work anymore. And these are former staff writers uh, on TV, sitcoms, one hours, um, feature writers. Their agents have dropped them. Uh, they know they can still do it. But nobody else does. And, and the whole meeting is, you know, consists of strategizing about how do we get back in the game. You guys could help them get back in the game. I mean, I think, I'm sure DGA, I'm not a member of DGA, but I'm sure they, they have some committee like that too. But I think working together, it's very easy to become a WGA signatory with a web series, the same as it is to become a SAG after a signatory. So if you partnered, if you don't consider yourself a writer and you really basically want to act, reach out to those, that department at the WGA. I just add something completely ridiculous, but uh, some of you may know Julian Fellows, who was the creator of Downton Abbey. And uh, Julian Fellows also wrote a novel called Snobs. Uh, about the British upper classes and people who pretended to the British upper classes. And what you said just reminded me, the longevity community. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he, created, he created a, uh, 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 a verb, uh, what is it, the aggregate verb, like a, 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 collective, a collective noun for actors. Uh, there was, you know, a covey of quail, a pride of lions. It was a complaint of actors. <laughs> 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 Julian Fellows, a complaint of actors. <laughs> so, uh, two, right? <laughs> so, Phil, I know you were you were asking about this, and I think um, I know uh, the the question being how do you raise money to make a series, and then how do you monetize it? That area of of um, the money aspect, which is terrifying to everyone, I think. Uh, you have how many subscribers to your show? Well, that's personal information. Oh, I'm would, sorry. Uh, no, we, we, we're, we're a healthy, uh, I'm a subscription series, so it's very, very healthy. We do like, you know, a high five figures a month. Um, thank you. And uh, I say high five figures, that's, you know. But no, yeah. Uh, but it's a subscription series, and I find that to be beneficial for, and you know, that's a fairly easy model. You know, if you guys don't want to hassle advertisers, get subscribers. Um, look, you have enough fans. Look, I've got on my Facebook fan page, I've got 60,000 followers, okay? Matt Besser is a friend of mine over at UCB who's a comic actor. He says to me, I got 100,000 followers. I figure about 50,000 of them are good for some money. So it's probably not a bad percentage. What you do is you ask for uh, uh, subscribers, take, take Visa, take Discover Card, take all of that, PayPal, and you get enough people to, you know, throwing money into your account every month. Go over to PayPal and you're looking at five or six or seven or $8,000 a month just from PayPal. Because people will pay. Look at Netflix. I mean, they're a monster now. And they, it's all subscription money. So advertising is one way to go, but subscription, um, the subscription model means you can do what you want. You don't have an advertiser to answer to. It's between you. And you're direct to the customer. They expect a lot of access, you know, which I have a, I have a Friday night chat where I talk to them, and we're going to do a race day at Santa Anita. You know, you do little promotions and stuff with them, so... Does that answer the question? Or yes, thank you. That's great. I also wanted to, um, I know I keep saying that's great, but it is all great, right? So I, I should think of another word, but it's all great. Oh, thank awesome. you. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So uh, I know that Amanda and Nancy, I know you both used crowdfunding, right? To, um, and uh, you talked about the pitfalls of you can only ask your, your family and friends once. But would you, would you compare 
because uh, there are a lot of different fu crowdfunding sites that work in different ways. So could you, you talk to our uh, folks here about what you chose and why? Um, I chose Indiegogo only because the mentor, uh, my mentor, was familiar with it and used it. Plus, the difference between Indiegogo and, say, Kickstarter is that Indiegogo, even if you don't reach your goal, you still have access to the money to use um, and just you end up making changes so that you can meet your financial uh, goal in that way. So you cut back on shoot days or whatever. Um, but there is a new um, platform called Seed and Spark that that's what you used okay well i'll let you talk about that well seed and spark uh was developed solely for uh film and tv projects and that's not the case with kickstarter or indiegogo um kickstarter you do have to raise a hundred percent of the money indiegogo you can keep whatever you raise seed and spark is somewhere uh in between you have to get to at least 80 percent of the goal to get the money but they have a better success rate now with um, with films and TV and that's what's on there and if they feature you you know that helps uh, I've never done the other two but I've heard that sometimes people have to wade through many pages of projects just to to find you um, and and they have tutorials at Seed and the Spark and they give you great advice about how to raise money for instance they said do a pre-launch hit a lot of your friends up and family and get promises and then try to go back to them tell them the campaign's live and get like 30 percent of your money in the first couple days because that makes you ra rise to the top of the list and then strangers start to find you and also offering perks like we offered, you know, a day on the set and um, extra work, and little did they know that you can't get your friends to do extra work for free, <laughs> and they're paying to do it. But, <laughs> but anyway, I think Seed and Spark is very good. I was happy. Um, one thing about the perks uh, that does, sometimes people really go for those, but I learned um, that if you're going to do a perk, make sure that it's deliverable digitally rather than mailing things because you'll eat up your, your um, uh, campaign money <laughs> just from mailing through the, the post office. So yeah, the merchandising. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So, I also want to, I know we're getting close to the Q&A time, so if you have questions, start writing them now. Um, Alessia, you touched on this, and I'd like you, uh, I'd like to hear from you all, but I, 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 I want to uh, ask you to maybe uh, clarify. Uh, you talked about well, you, you get what you paid for, and what do you think is the most important thing to spend your money on? What are those, those crew members, those, those areas, those production values that you felt were because you were the producer as well as an actor on this, what, what did you feel, I mean, how did you find your, your uh, writer, your director, uh, what are other uh, uh, crew people or production people did you feel were the most important for your success? Well, when I first got here, I, I started doing a lot of student films. And I realized right away that they weren't all the same. Just because you're in film school doesn't mean you're good. <laughs> then I realized that the only ones I need to go out for are the thesis projects. Because they're the ones that are graduating and they need this project in order to walk out the door. I met a lot of people along the way and I keep notes. I, I don't know why, but I, I keep a lot of notes. And so I, I made sure I had a picture and a name and an email and a phone number for everyone I worked with for five years. So that when I wanted a category, I knew where to go. I also gave them a rating. And that way I knew whether I wanted to branch out to that person or not. Plus, I knew their cost level. I've met 
sound people who would work for $100 a day. I've met DPs that'll work for $200 a day. I've met just about everybody in the business, except Michael until today. And now it's our pleasure to have met. <laughs> <laughs> and so I made it a point to make sure that everybody I met got a category, and then I went out and categorized it so that when I made my final page, I knew exactly how much money I was gonna be spending. Because at the end of the day, it's your money, or your crowdfunding money, or your GoFundMe money. It's one of those things where, as far as a DP, I think that's more important than talent, to be honest. I can make an actor look good. But I can't make the sound any better than what it is. I can't make the picture any better than what it is. It's more important to have a good sound person, a good DP. I think you're on your way. Why all the silence? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is. <laughs> I, I think it's 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 uh, it's a combination because we you know once Michael came onto our project it stopped being uh, the idea in my head that we were going to shoot this on my iPhone and it became uh oh got up our game Michael's on board um, and we want to make the picture look as good as it can look and we want to make our sound sound as good as it can be and we want our actors to be the best actors they can be we want the whole package and i think that um having well for us having michael on board it, it sort of raised the bar and uh everybody sort of stepped up and so it does make a, it, it makes a difference that what you're putting onto the screen has to look good and sound good because people are just not going to wade through bad quality uh, visuals and sound anymore because there's just so much good out there. And, and then, of course, what they want to hear and see are fabulous actors. So it, it all blends together. Now, but, uh, but may I add something to what you said already? He was doing, he was networking, which is really important. He was networking, he wasn't afraid to start with student films, i.e. the bottom, some might say, and that's important. And he was taking careful notes. And, I'm, and I think you were probably making friends with the personality I've seen so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's very important because you can ask your friends to do something that somebody else wouldn't. And, um, and there's an old, I, all I seem to be doing is quoting people today, but J.M. Barry, one of my favorite quotes from him is, always be a little kinder than necessary. <laughs> okay. And in this business, which is a very small business, you keep running into the same people again and again, and they say, not much talent, but I loved working with him. He was such a nice guy, you know, whatever it is. And between the troublemaker and, and the nice person, someone who's made an attempt to establish something, you will find, you, you'll begin to find crew. You will find actors who say, sure, I'll do that for almost, you know, for a lot less money than you think they might be a, a asking somebody else. And at the same time, you, you, you want to look at those individuals to see if they have their own equipment. <laughs> Very important. That, that's important. Yeah. Whether I have to rent the equipment or whether you own the equipment. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it is, it's pulling favors because you've done something to help them often and then they're helping you out. And, and I think that's part of the relationship that we establish with our, our core group. And, and I know that as soon as I saw Elester, um, I'm like, I know you. We met, and and it was at a MEFYC, I think. And um, he's so got a he, whole he's got a whole card on he, you. He yeah, oh, I, you I know. know. He does. I'm sure. I hope he's I got, got all at your least information. Uh, 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 how'd you rate me? <laughs> <laughs> but mm. but so he and he does do it right. He's 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 meeting people. He's networking um, because you never know. Who, you know who is going to, who you can help and who can help you, and, um, and it's all done because we're, we're creative people. Bill, you look like you're ready to. Uh, no, but I, I was just uh, inspired to just mention 
from what everybody's saying is, you know, I don't know how many people, if you guys have started businesses, it doesn't even have to be in entertainment. If you started a business, that's what it's about. I mean, you're starting a business. You're, um, you're doing it all, and you're marketing. Facebook has, a fantastic, um, has fantastic metrics for marketing. I think Facebook is good for marketing, getting a page like that. There's marketing, there's advertising, there's producing, there's the equipment, uh, there's the banking. Can you talk about that? Because this, this would yeah. be a perfect time. Because you are everything, well, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Yes, I am. And I don't know. I, uh, I, no, I, you I, produce I, a show every day, right? So yeah. how do you do that? <laughs> I think I am, but I'm not sure if I'm single. I, I've got to go back. I have to get check my note cards on that. Um, not, after, oh. not after I met him. He's taken. <laughs> I got a little nervous when you said that I spilled a bunch of water. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I did spill some water here. If somebody wants to get electrocuted, go to well, the cordon. Okay. okay. Um, I um, am a, uh, I've been in audio enter entertainment most of my life. So my podcast, I have a, a studio. Podcasting equipment is available, it's cheap, and you can get online really fast. It's a microphone, it's a little mixer, by that I mean the volumes, and then your computer. Um, I have a very extensively, you know, crazy studio because of all the idiotic things I demand <coughs> of myself, but if you have stories to tell, if you have characters to do, if you have interviews you want to do, it only takes a couple, three microphones. I would say the whole rig is going to cost less than a thousand bucks. Seriously, and then you get online. You get online and put it on iTunes. The freest platform out there is iTunes. Uh, I think SoundCloud actually will start charging you a monthly fee after a while. There's a million of these free platforms to put it out there. And then you go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, and you say, hey, here's my podcast. And you can throw it up there. You can link it there. Um, Probably in this book that Michael has right here, you know, Podcasting for Dummies, I think you had yeah, one there. One of these yeah. Facebook marketing for dummies, they yeah. have a podcast. It'll have an dummies. A, B, C, D, E, F, G on how to do it. It's pretty, pretty basic. I went to Hawaii um, on vacation and took a, a, a small uh, miniature version of what I do. It was just a, a microphone and my computer and a mixing board, and I did podcasting from there. I had to tone it down. I couldn't do a lot of the stuff I do in the studio, but I, I did my characters and talked about being in Hawaii and... Uh, Really, if you're a humorist, which is what I do, you just got to be funny. I mean, what's a take? Um, it takes being funny. I don't think you have to have a whole <laughs> lot of great equipment to do it. But um, and and uh, and then when I came back home, and of course you tell the audience, well, it was we were in Hawaii and we did this. You come back home, go into my studio. But it is something you do for less than a, a thousand a month. You can get your podcast out there, and you can promote it on Facebook and Twitter. And Instagram is a fantastic platform as well because Instagram allows you to to upload videos. Um, and it, I would say the whole thing would take about a month to really get your feet wet and get and get comfortable doing, just as a basic. And there's a million podcasts out there, but a lot of them do rise to the top and you know get it get it following. Yeah. So um, I I'm gonna ask Nancy about this, but I want to make an announcement that any of you that have questions, can you please raise them up in the air? They'll come around and uh, collect them because in just a few short minutes we will be getting to those. The cards should have been at your seats, I believe. Maybe. It's there's one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, Nancy, I want to talk to you about you know who you, how you put together the the crew that you trust. Uh, okay, okay, we're st okay. Nancy, uh, I I wanted to ask you about what you've. Okay, everybody. Thanks. Uh, um, what you feel was is the most important uh, places to spend your money and how you assembled the people that you trust? Good question, um, because I've spent a lot of years in the low rent district of the film business doing little short films on a dime. And what I've learned is um, you have to pay a sound person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we you learned have that, didn't we? I was I need the number of your hundred dollar guy <laughs> because <laughs> that's a bargain. Uh, and sound is, as someone said, sound is very, very hard to fix. Um, you need to pay a script supervisor. They don't work for the fun of it. Cinematographers, oddly, and composers are more like actors. They have a need to showcase themselves. So you know how you'll do equity waivers or student films or something, cinematographers will sometimes work because they're getting big union bucks 
being camera operators or gaffers and they want to make the transition to uh, DP. So they're willing to work for free to do that. Or if, if you have access to a good camera like a, like a Red or a Alexa or something, uh, they may they may work because they don't have enough footage of that on their on their reel, or even if they're stuck in doing horror films or corporate videos, and you're offering a comedy or a, a drama or something, that may be the enticement. Composers the same way; they want to get things the actual credits um, on IMDb. Um, I would suggest. Um, coming up with things that can be shot in the daytime <laughs> because Brilliant. you don't Brilliant. need you don't need lights or you don't need many for for shooting in the daytime and um, film schools are full of graduating I wouldn't suggest like the first year students but graduating students who want to get credits who want to get footage one way or another and because they've done student films they have all kinds of tricks too like like using foam core for uh, bounce boards for for sunlight and and regular lights and so things can, you can lower the budget substantially if uh, if you know where to spend the money thank you wonderful I think we uh, okay um, so I'm going to ask you all one last question before all the other questions come in. And that is, if you could pick one thing, I'm going to put these down. If you could pick one thing that you felt the most valuable or the most revelatory about this experience of creating your own content, what would it be? Oh, for me, definitely. Uh, the social media marketing, um, because I I went in it knowing something about directing and writing and filmmaking and all of that, but I I really didn't know anything about what it took to build an audience on social media. So um, that that was the most valuable thing I've learned during this process. Thank you, Lester. It's, it's going across the nation, so we, they have to hear you too. Once again, I, I would say it was starting out with, with getting those student films because uh, in just about every single one, I was the lead. So I was able to get good footage. And at the same time, I was able to see how everyone worked together. So once I moved away from that and started doing major projects, I could also look at them and know exactly where they're going and what they're doing without ever asking a question. So I was feeding off of everyone at the same time. Terrific. I think for me is I tend to be, as a, uh, a writer, I tend to be a little bit less social. And um, I realized that I had to get out of my comfort box and actually put myself out there and, and network. and. I realized that the more I did it, the more I liked it, um, but it's still uncomfortable. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with social media in general, truly. Um, I use it as a, as a tool. I think you have to be careful that the, that the tool doesn't become an end in itself, that it's used for what you want it to be. Um, and uh, I guess the thing that irritates me the most about it uh, is how once you do establish something, whether it's a Facebook page or something like that, then you have to, f people expect you to feed the beast constantly, <laughs> you know, and you feel this more than anybody because you do a podcast and they expect something new every day, thank you very much. So you, ha you have to decide what your job is and how you want to spend your time. Is it a tool to facilitate something else or is it an end in itself? Just be aware of that because I truly do have a love-hate relationship with it and uh, I've started things and said I don't want to do this I get myself into jams I start a, you know like a contest of, regarding the Tremors series I once I think it was a Halloween or two ago I said to all the followers let's have a, a Burt Gummer look-alike contest for your kids you know uh, and they started coming in and and the, the photographs and things like this and I thought, what the hell have I gotten myself into? 
you know, this, you know, uh, and uh, it got lots of follows and likes and all this other crap, but I found myself with a big job I didn't necessarily want to have to do, <laughs> judging, judging five-year-olds' costumes. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Phil? <laughs> um, this is more of a creative thing, but um, uh, the best thing that's happened to me, or, is that what it is that you asked? Yeah, about? it's yeah. like what you took away from it, this experience that you feel is the most. I used to work for people, and now I work for myself, and I used to do humor. I've, I've done it my whole life. And as, as funny as I felt my show was when I worked for big companies, I have more fun now. I laugh my ass off. It's really funny, too, because I probably don't have near the listeners that I had when I was on the radio, but I'm sitting there laughing at this stuff thinking, am I nuts? You know, I mean, this, is, this should be... This would be huge, you know. Uh, God, I'm good. Yeah, God, this guy's funny. Who is this dude, you know? Look what he's done, you know? And uh, I have a blast listening to work that I do now. Um, that's the best thing, working for yourself, man, is you got nobody, you know, leaning on you. So, and, and that, you can, become, you can become authentic, and that's the best thing, I think, for an artist is to be just unedited and, and let's see what you got. So, I'm very, I'm very impressed with me now. Thank you. <laughs> One, one, one last thing. I have a Facebook page, but I only post theatrical stuff. I don't put puppies or cousins or lakes or vacations or pretty girls. Well, <laughs> but I only post theatrical stuff. That's it. So when you look at my page, you, you know you're going to look at something that I'm doing or something that I just finished doing. It's a commercial enterprise as opposed to a personal yeah. enterprise. He's using it as a commercial venture. And that would be the difference between your timeline. A timeline and, and a page. And your page. Or it should exactly. be, ideally. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a friend's page is where you just talk about your friend. Let, I'm sorry, you guys. It's, it's not it's, a place for... It's just for, that it's, it's going to other places yeah, so yeah. they can It's Your friend page is like just for friends where you're talking about the puppies and the... And what I did stuff. on my vacation and my latest right. cat video, right. <laughs> Now, I know, I know we have our questions coming up, but Dan, I want to ask you before we go to questions, is there anything that you'd like to add that you weren't able to add from your point of view at this point? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, when I talk to the phone on, uh, you know, performers who are a little intimidated about just going through, you know, our process of uh, filling everything out online, uh, I, I think, you know, the, I want to leave one thing with the uh, audience and also the uh, members, you know, who are watching uh, remotely. Uh, you know, the union, we, the staff, we're here to really work with you. Uh, you know, we're not gatekeepers. We want to really just make sure you create the best product available. Uh, I think with technology right now, uh, you know, it's just an even playing field where people, you, you can create content where you don't have to worry about making very expensive uh, productions because technology is allowing that field to be a little, you know, even the playing field. And we're, we're here to help. We're here to assist. Uh, you know, please go to our website, uh, sagafter, www.sagafter.org slash production center. Uh, you can see our new media information. Uh, you send the information to our new media email. Uh, sign in NM Productions. Uh, uh, sorry, I wrote it down. I have so many. I'm sorry. Sign NM Projects at sagafter.org. And again, just, just call. Uh, we're here to help, and we're here to make uh, the best project you can make. Uh, you know, we just want to make sure that you uh, have all of your, uh, you know, ducks in a row. Great. And the quest. Thank you very much. But I think today is a step forward in taking this into our own hands and creating content and collaborating with people so that there is more content for us, so that we do have more to do. And so I thank you for this, and I take it as a work ride to do it. <laughs> thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you all for being here, and all of you there in other locals, thank you. Take care. <laughs>